Welcome to the Justice Journal Podcast. I'm Sacramento County District Attorney Anne Marie Schubert. I hope you enjoy this podcast series where we discuss important public safety issues and provide insight into who we are as an office and what we do both in the courtroom and in the community to provide the highest level of public safety through prosecution, prevention, and innovation. Welcome to the first Sacramento County District Attorney Justice Journal podcast. I'm Shelley Oreo. For our first episode, District Attorney Amory Schubert will join me for a conversation about cold cases and the role of DNA in forensic science. Anne Marie is nationally known for forensic DNA and cold case prosecutions. Welcome, Anne Marie. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about this topic. So, can you start by telling us about your passion for pursuing justice through DNA evidence and cold case prosecutions? I can talk about cold cases all day. So my experience started in the mid-90s when I was actually a a deputy district attorney in Solano County trying uh, sexual assault cases. And I had my first ever forensic DNA case, which involved an individual that was a serial rapist by the name of Scott Allen Wright, who had kidnapped a 16-year-old teenager while she was walking home from the bus stop. And that's when I realized, and this is again over 25, almost 25 years ago, that DNA was truly the greatest tool ever given to law enforcement. There is a cold case unit in our office, and can you tell us about how that started? Sure. So back in the 90s, um, late 90s, after I had started doing a lot of DNA cases and became more proficient at it, understood its value in cases, and really believe very strongly that it was underutilized back then, and it was really a new type of technique. I, when I came to Sacramento in 1996, a few years later, I started teaching cold cases for the Department of Justice. And we had a class, Cold Case Investigations, where people would bring unsolved murder cases and try to brainstorm and figure out ways to solve cases. And at that time, our office did not have uh, a cold case unit. So I went to then District Attorney Jan Scully and my boss and said, listen, we should do this. There's a lot of unsolved murders out there that we can identify and we can solve. And with their blessing, we started the cold case unit around 2001, 2002, and I was the lead prosecutor on it. Can you tell us about some of the significant cases that have been solved? Sure. One of the very first cases that we identified, what we did at that time um, was we went around to all the law enforcement agencies and said, tell us all your unsolved cases that you think have biological evidence, that potential DNA, um, and give us a list. And we started doing that. One of the very first cases that we went to and um, looked at was a young teenager that was murdered in the North area by the name of Ollie George. And we did DNA testing on that. And ultimately, we identified the individual, and he was in prison. And our office then, right before he was supposed to be released, he was arrested and he was then prosecuted. His name was Dennis Nelson, and he was then convicted later on by another prosecutor in our office. That was one example. There was many, many examples that ended up on the list. There was Penny Parker, who was a 15-year-old kid who went missing from the North area. She was a newspaper carrier for the Sacramento Bee. Her body was found out in the North area. Uh, That was a fantastic, you know, innovative case on the way that we solved it because Law enforcement, SAC PD, always suspected an individual. Uh, He had moved since the murder to another state. And so that was a a novel way to solve that case because we didn't have his DNA. We ended up doing kind of a reverse um, paternity testing. And we were able to prove that that individual who had since moved had, in fact, been the one that had killed Penny Parker. We issued an arrest warrant for him and we were prepared to prosecute him. He ultimately killed himself when law enforcement came to serve that arrest warrant. I can talk all day long about specific cases if you want to ask me about them, because it, it's there are so many out there that if we had not done DNA testing, we would not have solved that murder. One is Richard Hirschfield, which right. we're going to do a discussion on in our next podcast uh, episodes. Can you tell us a little bit about the Hirschfield case? And Sure. When we started the cold case unit, um, I ultimately was moved to the homicide unit because um, obviously most of those were in the homicide unit. And myself and along with another deputy DA who's now a judge, Lori Earl, actually looked at that case. We knew it was unsolved. It had a long history because um, 
first of all, it was very tragic. These two college kids that go missing from UC Davis in 1980, their bodies were found here in Sacramento. Rape, murder, horrific, horrific crime. It affected this community and, and the Davis community very much so. There was a group of individuals that had been charged back in, I think, the 90s, and they were ultimately exonerated with DNA. And so the case was still unsolved. So we looked at that case. Um, we got the evidence from Yolo County. And then I'm sure that they're going to tell you in the next podcast what happened, so I don't want to portray it. But it was it was just another example of the power of DNA and the power of what I call the DNA data bank to solve crime. One that's more recent and probably one of the most notable, which I know you can't say too much about this, but um, the identification and arrest of Joseph D'Angelo, otherwise known as East Era Rapist. Can right. you tell us a little bit about that? Well, what I can say is that in back in 2001 or so, when I went to the office, uh, Jan Scully and my boss, Jeff Rose, and said, listen, we should start a cold case unit. That was one at the top of the list because not only professionally, but also as many folks know personally for me, because I grew up in Sacramento, I knew how much that case affected the office. At that time, when I was given the green light, yeah, you can, you can try to start looking at these. There was no idea at that time that they were, that there was murders that were connected by DNA. And it was through, you know, a lot of teamwork, a lot of work from multi-jurisdictions, including Contra Costa and other counties that ultimately, we realized through DNA that, that, that the East Area Rapist was linked as the Golden State Killer. And so that case, without going into great detail and the specific facts now, um, I think everybody understands the magnitude of that case. Um, They also, I think anybody that understands it knows that it's the power of the DNA, which I said for years that that would be what solves this case. What are some of the other positive results that have happened in pursuing this cold case and other cold cases? Well, forensic DNA, you know, has been around since the mid-90s. And some of the most positive things that have come out of forensic DNA and the realization of the power of the technology is, you know, in 2004, California voters passed an initiative called Prop 69. Ironically enough, that initiative was funded primarily by an individual named Bruce Harrington, who's the brother of Keith Harrington, who was one of the victims on the Golden State Killer. And uh, I'm quite sure he funded that because he wanted his brother's murder to be solved. Before 2004, our DNA databank, which is, you know, run by the Department of Justice, had, I think, solved or uh, made hits, as we call them, in about 1,200 cases. Since the passage of Prop 69, which greatly expands the number of people who have to give their DNA, over 60,000 cases have now had what we call cold hits or hits on it. And so the power that technology going from maybe 1,200 hits to over 60,000 Uh, tells you, quite frankly, the power of the technology. And let's not forget that it's not just about identifying people. It also has this incredible power to exonerate or exclude people. Because in every case where you have maybe an unsolved, you might get a DNA sample from somebody you think is a, quote, person of interest. But ultimately, that person is, is excluded as that person, as the person who is responsible for a crime. So it goes back to that whole theory, that whole quote that I've always used when I used to do trials, it is the silent witness to the truth. So it works both ways. It works both respect. ways. And it's mm-hmm. it's not just the power of solving cases. It's also the power of being more efficient, not wasting resources, not running down, as I say, rabbit hole after ra- rabbit hole, thinking somebody did something when you have the evidence to show he or she did or did not do that. So it's incredibly powerful. Okay. What about the Dead Inmate Project? So back in... Um, the early 2000s when we started doing cold cases, we, our lab, along with the law enforcement agent, SAC PD and SAC Sheriff, um, we had a couple unsolved murders that we are from the 70s. And we know that the individual killed two people. We don't know who the individual is. We know they killed the same, it's the same person because the DNA matches. And so my thought at that time was, well, maybe he's dead, the person who killed these two individuals. And so we, thought, well, maybe he died in prison, maybe he died on parole. And we ultimately, through working with the Department of Corrections, the Attorney General's office, uh, found out that there was somewhere around 25,000 people, inmates or parolees, who had died without ever giving their DNA. And so we worked to develop this project 
the acronym is the Dead Guy Project, but it's really called D3, which is DNA from Deceased Inmates. Um, and so through that, our office, our lab, um, our law enforcement agencies have looked to find DNA from individuals who either died in prison, if we have their DNA still, don't mean we d dig them up, we don't dig them up, but if we're able to find his or her DNA from other sources, then we get that DNA, we then upload it, and we've had success here. We had an individual that was um, convicted of a series of murders in Los Angeles. He was housed at Folsom State Prison. He, I believe, ultimately committed suicide, and then we were able to get his DNA sample through that autopsy. Well, through that case, or through that sample, we then were able to solve another murder in Los Angeles County. So while some people say, well, who cares, the guy's dot dead, for me, there was a, there is a family out there that wondered who killed their loved one. And so now that family was told, we know who did it, and we know that person's no longer here, and, and you know, the answer's in provided. So it's incredibly powerful tool. It's not just about the prosecution. It's about finding the answer. It's about finding the answer. It's about finding, I mean, families have waited for decades, and, and I've heard it from so many folks that have lost loved ones that they never thought they'd ever get an answer. They never thought they'd get justice. They thought they were long since forgotten. And the reality is, is that our law enforcement partners, SAC PD, SAC Sheriff, our other agencies in the county, our crime lab, um, they do care and they do work hard on these cases and they use the best available evidence they have to find those answers. I understand there was a recent break in Nevada. When we were looking um, to try to find the answer on the East Area Rapist Golden State Killer, we I was notified by a colleague of mine that we should be looking at these other states and what their laws are on DNA collection and specifically to look at Nevada. And in California, our DNA law is what we call retroactive, meaning if you're already in prison, then you gotta give your DNA even if the law passed today, which makes sense because you got all these five people in prison, they should give their DNA. If they committed a crime 20 years ago, they should be identified. That's not how it was at the time in Nevada. So the law was not applied retroactively. So there's lots and lots of people in their prison system who had not given their DNA. And so myself and a number of other elected DAs primarily the ones involved in the East Area Rapist Golden State Killer, wrote a letter, met with the folks or had conversations with the DAs from Nevada, worked with them to contact their attorney general, and the attorney general changed their opinion and said, yes, our law can be applied retroactively. We knew at that time that applying it retroactively would in fact solve cold cases for Nevada, or that there were people in prison in Nevada that had committed crimes. It just... You know, you've got people on their death row, you've got people in, in there for murder, rape murder, and um, just history and experience tells us they've probably done, it, done other things. And in fact, that's what happened. So one of the first cases that they just recently solved was a horrific um, crime series that occurred in Colorado, and the individual happened to be in Nevada State Prison. So that case is going to proceed forward. I'm sure Colorado is going to seek to extradite him, but it's just another example of the power of the technology. DNA and forensic science has come a long way. A long Do way. you envision where it's going to go in the future? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the, the East Area Rapist Golden State Killer is an example of, of the movement of the technology and the innovation of the technology and the ability to solve crimes. I mean, even since the time of the arrest in the East Area Rapist Golden State Killer, if you look at the stories across this country, crimes that would never ever have been solved um, have been solved now because of new and innovative ways to use the DNA. So it's just to me, I've always said you never underestimate, it's not just the power of the technology, it's about being persistent. It's about pushing the envelope to you know, just keep looking, as I say, for the needle in the haystack because oftentimes it's there, it's a matter of how much. You know, another example of, of really good outcomes um, of DNA legislation or the use of DNA is when, when Prop 69 passed in California, it allowed for us to collect DNA on anybody arrested on a felony. And so back in the mid, late 80s, uh, our county, the city of Sacramento, had a murder of an 80-year-old woman named Sophia McAllister. And that case was actually brought to the cold case class. And through some of the work of SAC PD and, and ideas that came out of that, 
You know, they figured out there was DNA involved in that case. It was, in fact, a rape murder. And but for Prop 69, which was, you know, a guy arrested on a felony crime, uh, that case would never have been solved. And ultimately, they solved it. Um, an individual named Donald Carter was identified as her killer. And our office, Chris Orr, another prosecutor office, prosecuted him. Um, and he was convicted, and now he's in prison. And it's just another example of the power of legislation, technology, and law enforcement working together uh, to try to identify individuals. Is there anything you want to add that we haven't covered? Just for me, uh, you know, I, I obviously have a passion for cold cases. I have a passion for forensic DNA. Part of it is is not just based on you know, trying to find answers and trying to support victims and, and help their loved ones. But it's also because it does have that power to identify the guilty and exonerate the innocent. And so it is the silent witness to the truth. It always has and always will be. And it's only a matter of us being persistent and passionate to find that answer. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Anne-Marie, for sharing your insight, experiences, and successes with DNA and cold cases. I'm sure we'll hear from you on future topics. And stay tuned for our next podcast, which we mentioned will be a more focused discussion on the Richard Hirschfeld case, which is often called the UC Davis Sweetheart Murders. Thank you. you. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find all of the Justice Journal podcasts on our website at sacda.org, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube.